we can get started. Um, cool, awesome. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm super, super excited to be here today uh, to introduce uh, Trudy Rajwani. Uh, she's a final year PhD candidate at CMU working in Graham Newbig's group. Uh, her PhD work is focused on very low resource languages. Um, in addition, she's worked on several other uh, domains as well. Um, she's had previous collaborations during internships with Bloomberg and MSR. And uh, previously, in recognition of her awesome work, she's earned uh, several awards, including the Bloomberg PhD Fellowship. And more recently, she was named to Forbes's 30 Under 30 for Science. Uh, and today, yeah, she'll be talking to us about No Language Left Behind, Unlocking Text Data for Under-Resourced Languages. And we're super excited to have her. Um, so yeah, uh, take it away, Shruti. OK, um, thank you, Jack, for the really kind introduction. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you so much for coming to the talk. Um, yeah, as Jack said, I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. And today, I will be talking about some of my recent work on um, uh, developing NLP models for under-resourced languages. So yeah, let's get started. Um, as we all know, there has been considerable progress in recent years in expanding NLP technologies to languages beyond English. This has been driven by several factors, including the creation of benchmark data sets for many tasks across a diverse set of languages. And another driving force has been the development of large-scale language models that are pre-trained on many languages. And this immense progress in NLP research has also led to commercially available technologies like voice assistants, predictive keyboards, web search, and so on, expanding their support to many more languages. So let's look at pre-trained multilingual language models. They are trained on unlabeled text in each language, and this is often sourced from multilingual collections like Wikipedia or the Common Crawl. And they typically support 100 to maybe 200 languages. And this massive multilinguality enables cross-lingual transfer for many language tasks, like named entity recognition, question answering, and so on, um, reducing the amount of annotated data that's required in each language. However, many of these languages are very low resourced and cross-lingual transfer may not be straightforward. So a large part of my research has been focused on developing models and techniques to improve performance in very low resource languages. For example, my work has introduced uh, zero-shot transfer learning for entity linking, which is trained, which is a model that's trained on multiple high-resource languages, uses the international phonetic alphabet to transfer across languages that don't share a script, as well as multilingual knowledge bases for better entity linking. And these additional sources of information actually increased zero-shot accuracy by 45% on a bunch of low-resource languages. I've also worked on low resource named entity recognition using information from knowledge bases as additional features to the model. Um, again, improving performance on multiple low resource languages. So having NLP models that are inclusive of a large number of languages has multiple societal benefits. It enables access to information and education in other languages. So for example, if we could automatically translate Wikipedia content to many different languages. Uh, and with these current systems that support so many languages, everyday technologies can serve many more people. However, while some of my research has been focused on improving NLP for the lower resourced among these 200 languages that current multilingual models support, today I'm going to be talking about something different. While these models support far more languages than NLP technologies from a few years prior, they still only include around 2% of the over 7,000 living languages in the world. So most of the remaining languages are underrepresented in state-of-the-art NLP research and development, and the over 2.2 billion people that natively speak these languages are underserved by modern language technologies. So what's stopping us from expanding existing multilingual models to more languages? One of the major factors is the lack of unlabeled text. So let's take a look at Wikipedia, one of the sources of unlabeled text for many languages. Wikipedia has articles in something like 300 languages, but they aren't evenly distributed. The top 15 to 20 languages have over a million articles each, but there's a steep drop as we move towards the long tail. And similar patterns hold for other large-scale multilingual collections. So the lack of unlabeled data is a significant bottleneck 
in annotating data sets, where if we don't have existing text to annotate, we would have to recruit speakers of the language to create it. And this is far more expensive than just having them annotate existing text. And the performance of multilingual models is limited by the amount of text available. So most of our technological advances are concentrated on languages that have easily available text. Further, while from Wikipedia and the common crawl and so on, we do have some amount of easily accessible text in a few hundred languages. Um, there are thousands of languages without sufficient text for building NLP systems. Without resources, how do we start moving towards improving the representation of these languages in modern NLP? So it's actually not true that text data doesn't exist in many of these languages. However, it's locked away in formats that aren't machine readable and can't be used to build NLP systems. There is a vast amount of text that's available only in the form of printed books, handwritten notes, and typewritten documents. So how many such documents exist? And are they in languages for which we actually need unlabeled text? We took a look at publicly available archives. For example, um, the Internet Archive has over 6 million scanned books in at least 1,100 languages. And this is significantly larger than the current set state-of-the-art multilingual models support. And there are also tens of thousands of documents in linguistic archives, like the Endangered Languages Archive and the Archive of the Indigenous Languages of Latin America. And these are primarily resources collected or produced by documentary linguists over the decades, containing text data in hundreds of very low resource languages. So given that we do have a large number of documents that are potential sources of text data, digitizing them into a machine readable format can kickstart the development of NLP systems in many more languages. We can use the extracted text to expand multilingual language models to more languages, as well as annotate data for downstream NLP tasks. There are other benefits to the digitization process as well, particularly in terms of supporting communities that speak low resource languages. The digitization process will make texts in the native language accessible and searchable, and this can aid researchers, educators, and libraries working on these languages. So extracting text from scanned images of printed books, such as this example from a book of folktales in the low resource language Greco, requires optical character recognition, or OCR. The OCR system identifies each character present in the image to produce the text in a machine readable format. Um, OCR is a very well studied task and state of the art methods have high accuracy on languages that have enough resources for training models. There are several off the shelf OCR tools that support many scripts and languages like Google Vision and Tesseract. And these have pre-trained models for about 80 to 100 languages. However, there's little prior work on very low resource settings. And to extract documents from, uh, uh, to extract text from documents that don't already have unlabeled text corpora, we need techniques that work well without, without, without very much training data. So in this talk, I'm going to present some of my recent work that takes a step in this direction. I will briefly discuss the creation of an evaluation data set for low resource text extraction and analyze the shortcomings of existing methods on these languages. I will also introduce a neural model for improving OCR for low resource languages using the technique of automatic OCR post-correction, as well as a semi-supervised learning method to improve performance without manual annotation using the unlabeled raw images from the documents that need to be digitized. Uh, most of the work I'm presenting today has been previously published in recent years. So um, yeah, the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, the evaluation data set that we created for the low resource OCR task. The data set contains manually transcribed documents in four languages, a book of epic poetry in Ainu, a book of folk tales in the Greco language of Southern Italy, three children's storybooks in the Yaka language of Nepal, and linguistic documentation in the Kwakwala language of Canada. So these languages are orthographically diverse, and I'm going to um, I'm focusing on that because it becomes important in our analysis with Ainu using the Latin script, Krico using a combination of the Greek and Latin scripts, and Yaka using the Devanagari script. The document in Kwakwala has an orthography that's unique to the language known as the Boas writing system. Um, it's based on Latin script alphabets, but has several additional diacritics and digraphs for representing sounds that are unheard in other languages. 
So these languages are very under-resourced in terms of modern NLP techniques. Uh, they don't have easily accessible, unlabeled text resources. They're not supported by current multilingual models and don't have easily accessible bilingual lexica. In our data set as well, we have fewer than 1,000 transcribed lines per, per language, and this is significantly smaller than OCR data sets for most other languages. So as we discussed earlier, OCR is a very well-studied task. There are supervised models that are based on large neural networks, and they use thousands of transcribed images for training. Unsupervised methods rely on a language model in the target language, and this, of course, requires a text corpus to produce. We also have large-scale off-the-shelf tools that are trained and support up to 100 languages. And while these aren't trained on any of the low resource languages in our data set, they are trained on many, many languages in many different scripts. And so they can potentially act as a general character recognizer. Since training a supervised model from scratch is infeasible with our small data set, we focus on analyzing the performance of existing unsupervised and off the shelf OCR systems in low resource settings. So um, we measure OCR performance in terms of word error rate. And this is the word edit distance between the prediction and the reference divided by the total number of words in the reference. And since we're looking at error rate, obviously um, lower is better. The first system we look at is the Google Vision OCR. It's an off-the-shelf tool that has models for many languages in 29 scripts. The tool also has script-specific models. So for example, a model for the Latin script or one for the Devanagari script. And these are really useful for our scenario because the tool doesn't directly support any of the languages in our evaluation data set. But some of the languages use the same script as several high resource languages. And we actually see that in action when we look at the performance here. Um, we see that the model performs really well where, for languages where uh, the language uses a script that's already known to the model. So this demonstrates the tool's ability for zero-shot cross-lingual transfer across languages that share scripts. Um, in particular, we see that the word error rate is lower than 30% for Ainu, Griko, and Yaka with the Latin, Greek, and Devanagari scripts. However, in the case of Quaquola, which uses um, the BOAS orthography as its alphabet, the model performs quite a bit worse with the word error rate over 80%. So um, even for the languages where the model performs well, we did some analysis and found some common errors. So if we look at this example in Greco, the output from the Google Vision system on the image does show a couple of errors. One of the major sources of errors for the languages in our data set is that the system isn't able to handle mixed scripts within a single line, like this case where the Greco word uses both the Greek and Latin alphabet. Additionally, lower resource languages often use uncommon diacritics to represent unique sounds, and the system hasn't seen these in the high resource languages it was trained on. We're also going to look at the performance of an open source, unsupervised OCR software called Ocular. Um, Ocular requires a language model in the target language, but doesn't need any transcribed images for training. So um, we train Ocular's language model with the small number of transcriptions we have in the data set for each language. And looking at the performance, we see that it is quite reliant on the quality of the language model. The performance of Ainu and Yaka, which have relatively less data than the other two languages, are quite a bit worse than the Google Vision system. Uh, however, Ocular is considerably better than the off-the-shelf tool for the Quacola data set. And this is expected because the model's character vocabulary does contain all the alphabet in the language's unique writing system. So the existing methods we looked at do have reasonable performance on our data set, with word error rates lower than 40% across all the languages. But compared to OCR accuracy and higher resource settings, there is considerable room for improvement. That said, the majority of words are recognized correctly by these systems. So we use these transcriptions as a starting point for further improvements, rather than attempting to train a new model. In the remainder of the talk, I'm going to present methods to improve the results from OCR systems, relying on the technique of automatic OCR post-correction. Given the output from an existing system on a scan document, our previous analysis indicated that we should expect it to have some recognition errors. So the process of post-correction takes this noisy first-pass transcription as input and fixes the recognition errors to produce a corrected transcription. 
Previous work has used post-correction to counteract the lack of training data for new fonts, layouts, and domains without having to retrain the system for each new distribution. Um, in this talk, we will develop post-correction methods for languages without enough data to train a high-performance OCR system. The standard setup of post-correction is a text-based sequence-to-sequence task. It doesn't use any visual information. The first pass, OCR, is the input text, and the corrected transcription is the output text. Uh, OCR post-correction is well-studied in the high-resource setting, particularly for English, and recent state-of-the-art methods primarily use character-level neural encoder-decoder models. So um, in these models, characters in the first pass OCR are converted to embeddings, um, passed to an LSTM encoder, and a decoder LSTM with an attention mechanism generates the corrected transcription at the character level. Existing work has typically relied on supervised training with lots of parallel OCR transcriptions and their corresponding corrected text. Because our manually annotated data set is significantly smaller, we're going to build on previous models and adapt them to learning in low resource settings. So with the minimal annotated data we have, it is challenging for the model to learn a good distribution. We introduce structural biases into the encoder decoder framework to make it easier for the model to learn from small amounts of data. So these structural components are based on the nature of the post correction task. The first of these is a diagonal attention loss. Um, Post-correction is approximately a monotonic sequence-to-sequence -sequence task, and reordering is rarely expected. So with this in mind, if we create an attention, uh, if we create a matrix from the attention vectors from all the time steps, we expect the attention weights to be higher for elements closer to the diagonal. We add uh, attention weights that are off the diagonal to the training loss at each time step, encouraging lower weights at those elements. Uh, note that this isn't hard monotonic attention, but is a soft inductive bias that we add to the model. We also know that the first pass OCR recognizes a majority of the characters correctly, so we add a copy mechanism to allow the model to copy a character from the input text. Um, the decoder LSTM generates a probability distribution for the next character, while the copy mechanism samples a character from the attention vector a generation probability determined by learnable parameters at each time step interpolates between the decoder and the copy mechanism. Uh, we also add a coverage mechanism to keep track of attention weights from previous time steps and prevent the model from, adding, uh, from attending to the same characters repeatedly. Uh, we create a coverage vector that is the sum of the attention vectors from previous time steps and use that as extra input in future time steps. So these, these biases can likely be learned by the model with enough data, but in our low resource setting, adding them explicitly is a simple way to ease learning. Uh, the next thing we do is leverage additional information from the source document. More specifically, many documents that contain text in a low resource language also contain a translation of the text. For example, translations are often found in interlinear glosses, dictionaries, linguistic documentation, and so on. This is also observed in the documents in our data set. The book containing Ainu poetry contains its translation in Japanese. Similarly, the Greco book has translations in Italian, and the Yaka texts have translations in Nepali and English. We can apply an off-the-shelf OCR tool to get the transcriptions from the scanned images of these uh, books. And since these translations are typically in higher resource languages, we can expect the OCR to generally be of high quality. So in order to use these translations, so in our model, we have a character level encoder for the low resource language, for example, the first pass OCR in Greco. We add another encoder to the model that, produce, that processes the OCR transcription for the translation, for example, the translation of the text in Italian. Um, to use information from both sources, we concatenate the context vectors from both attention mechanisms to be used in the decoding process. So having this multi-source mechanism essentially conditions the decoder additionally on the text translation. Uh, we train the model in a supervised way with a small amount of annotated data we have in the data set. So we first look at how the baseline uh, OCR post correction system performs as compared to the first pass OCR. Um, and this is a system that's been used by lots of prior work in OCR post correction. So because of the small size of the data set, we report the word error rate using tenfold cross validation averaged over five random seeds. 
For each language, the best performing first pass OCR is selected. So we have um, Ocular for Quacola and Google Vision for the other three languages. Uh, the baseline method, as I said previously, is a character level encoder decoder model without any of our proposed adaptations. So we can see the word error rate with the baseline model here. It actually improves the word error rate a little bit for Greco, but worsens performance for the other languages. And this indicates that the limited data is not enough for the model to learn a good distribution. But when we include our proposed adaptations to the model, the word error rate reduces for all the languages in our data set by up to 52% over the first pass OCR. Uh, we also did an ablation study to check which adaptations were most helpful. All of the adaptations that I presented uh, did help improve performance, but the copy, the copy mechanism impacted performance the most. So um, yes, yeah, so now we have a post-correction model that's trained with supervised learning on a small number of manually transcribed pages. While we did see a decrease in word error rate over the first pass OCR, further improvements will require more manual annotation beyond the transcriptions we already have. So in this part of the talk, I'm going to present a method to improve performance without additional annotation. Uh, more specifically, while we only have a small number of manually transcribed pages, we have a large number of unannotated raw images that actually need to be digitized. The documents in our data set contain hundreds of pages, but only a very small subset is manually transcribed. So I'm going to present a semi-supervised learning method that improves transcription accuracy by efficiently utilizing these unlabeled images that are obtained much more easily than manual annotations. First, we incorporate the very simple semi-supervised technique of self-training into the post-correction model that I just described. We can get a first-pass OCR on the hundreds of unlabeled images we have, apply a trained post-correction model like our previous best supervised model, and get uh, predictions on these images. We can use the predictions as pseudo-training data to retrain the model. And uh, we uh, repeat this process iteratively to get better predictions. Although self-training is a simple approach, incorrect predictions in the pseudo-training data may introduce noise into the model. And this can potentially reinforce errors in the next iteration of self-training. So, in our initial experiments, we analyzed the predictions to figure out whether we could bias post-correction towards ignoring the noise and generating correct words. In the unlabeled images we are applying self-training on, the same word may be present several times in different contexts, like this example from our Quacola dataset. Uh, the model may make different predictions for different instances of the word, both correct and incorrect predictions. So for example, here the word was predicted correctly seven times and incorrectly nine times. So we empirically observed that the incorrect predictions for a specific word are typically incorrect in different ways since the word appears in different contexts across pages and documents. So essentially this means that different subsets of characters in the word are incorrectly predicted. And the noise from self-training is typically inconsistent at the word level. This leads to the correct form of the word being more frequent than any of the incorrect forms, even if the word is incorrectly predicted more times. So to counteract the noise from self-training, we develop a technique to use this frequency information to reinforce the correct forms of the word during post-correction decoding. Um, so during the decoding process, the probability of the next character depends on the decoder LSTM. And based on our previous observations on inconsistent noise, we want to incorporate a probability based on word frequency. So how do we get these frequency-based probabilities? A very simple method that explicitly models for word frequency is a count-based language model. So given the predictions from self-training, we can train a unigram word-level model on the counts of the word forms. And this gives us frequency-based probabilities of each word essentially forming a noisy weighted lexicon from the predictions. We also use smoothing to reserve some probability mass for words that are not seen in the predictions. And a significant advantage of using the count-based language model is that it's very easy to update as the predictions iteratively improve with self-training. So now we have um, the frequency probabilities from the Unigram language model, and this acts as a weighted lexicon. So this information is combined with the neural decoder for post-correction in a process we call lexically aware decoding. 
However, there's still one step missing. The probabilities from the unigram language model are at the word level, but decoding for post correction is at the character level. So how do we get character probabilities from the word frequency language model? Uh, what we do is we represent the word frequency language model with a weighted finite state automaton, or WFSA. WFSA is a set of states with transitions between them, and each transition accepts a character and has a score associated with it. Uh, so yeah, consider this simple language model with two words, dog and door, uh, to demonstrate the construction of the WFSA representation. The WFSA has a start state from which we add transitions to consume each character of the word in sequence. So if we're looking at the word dog, we would add transitions to consume DOG. The score to enter that path of states is the probability from the count-based language model, and subsequent transitions are assigned a probability of one. So the total cost of the path to process the word dog at the character level is the same as the probability of dog from the word level language model. And this is essentially the behavior we want, where we convert uh, the word probabilities to a character level representation. So we can do the same thing for all the other words in the count-based language model and uh, form an initial representation of the WFS for the WFSA representation. So if we have the WFSA that's processed all the characters in the current output, for example, D-O-O-R, and is in the last state on that path, the outputs in the post-correction task are lines or sentences that contain more than one word. But in its current form, the WFSA can only accept a single word and not the remaining characters in the output. So if we had a space character in the first alphabet of the next word, it wouldn't be able to accept these additional characters. So to allow this, we add a transition back to the start state from the end of each word that accept word boundary symbols like spaces and punctuation. And if when the model is back in the start state, it can begin accepting characters from the next word. Since we're in a low resource setting, the language model likely isn't high coverage. So we do need to be able to score words that are unknown. To do this, we add an unknown word state to the WFSA with a transition that doesn't consume any symbols to enter it. So this is known as an epsilon transition. And uh, the penalty to enter the unknown word state is the smooth unknown word probability from the word frequency language model. The unknown state can accept any sequence of characters. So we score these sequences using a character n-gram language model that's also learned from the predictions during the self-training process. We apply standard algorithms for determination and minimization on these states, and this leads to an efficient and compact representation of the count-based language model. So coming back to our lexically aware decoding formulation, we have the next character probability determined by the decoder LSTM and a frequency-based probability. So this frequency-based probability would simply be the transition score from the current state of the WFSA for that character, because WFSA representation gives us those character level scores based on the frequency language model. We use simple linear interpolation to combine the probabilities weighted by a tunable hyperparameter. So using the WFSA representation gives us a simple and effective way to do joint inference with a character level neural decoder and a word level account based language model. Overall, our semi supervised model uses the label data to train a baseline post correction model and for fine tuning, while using the unlabeled data for self training and lexically aware decoding. We conduct experiments to evaluate the performance of the semi-supervised learning method as compared to the supervised model I presented earlier. So we have um, the word error rate for the first pass OCR and the supervised model, which as we saw previously, does reduce the word error rate for all the languages in our data set. So if all we do is include self-training, we do see some improvement in performance for Krico, Yaka, and Quakola. But the word error rate actually gets a little bit worse for Ainu. And this indicates that the noise introduced through self-training may sometimes overpower its general utility. However, when we add lexically aware decoding and combine it with self-training, we get significant reductions in word error rate over the supervised model on all the languages in our data set. This is especially noticeable in Ainu, where using self-training independently resulted in worse performance, but adding lexically aware decoding improved the word error rate by 15%. 
So looking at the overall picture, with respect to the first pass OCR, the supervised model improves performance in all cases. When we add the proposed semi-supervised learning technique, word error rate is reduced by up to 59% over existing OCR systems. This graph shows the character error rate for the same experiment. And character error rate is also a useful measure because it indicates what fraction of characters in the output a human transcriber would have to correct in order to have error-free text. So compared to existing OCR systems, our best method improves character error rate in all the languages with error reductions between 33 and 58%. So we use the best first pass OCR as a starting point. However, for many under-resourced languages, uh, the first pass can actually be significantly less accurate. So to evaluate the reliance of our post-correction system on the first pass, we look at the Quacola dataset and two first pass systems. An off-the-shelf tool, which has a high error rate because the script is not fully known to the tool, and Ocular, which has a language model trained with a small amount of target language data and has a more accurate first pass OCR. So we have the word error rate with our method here as well. And we're able to see that the post correction is able to reduce the error rate for both systems by a large amount, even when the first pass OCR is not very accurate to begin with. So the first pass OCR from uh, the off-the-shelf tool on this randomly selected image is shown here with the incorrect words highlighted. And when we apply post-correction, uh, our method fully corrects over 75% of the incorrect words highlighted in blue here. And using automatic post-correction can thus make manual search and proofreading much easier for downstream users. So to summarize what we've talked about so far, Thousands of languages don't have easily accessible text to build NLP models and data sets because there are only uh, a few hundred languages typically available in large-scale multilingual collections. However, text data does exist in many of these languages, but it's locked away in formats that aren't machine readable, like printed books and documents. In this talk, I presented methods to improve the results of OCR systems in extracting text from documents in very low resource languages. The supervised multi-source model reduced word error rate by up to 52%, and we got further improvements with the lexically aware semi-supervised technique. So I'd also like to talk about the practical impact and applications that the models we discussed today are having. Our document contains, uh, our dataset contains documents in four very low resource languages. Previously, there was almost no machine readable text in these languages. But with our methods, there are now hundreds of pages of machine-readable text extracted for each language with very low character error rates. As a specific case study of the impact, let's look at the Quacola language. While developing our models, we collaborated with documentary linguists and Quacola speakers to identify which documents would be the most useful to extract text from. Uh, the BOAS texts, which are 10 volumes of documentation about the Quaquala language and the community that speaks it, was produced by Franz Boas 100 years ago. These texts have tremendous cultural and linguistic value, but they were minimally accessible to researchers because they only existed as hundreds of scanned images. So manual search was required to locate information, and the BOAS writing system is an older orthography for Quaquala that's hard to read. With our post-correction pipeline, uh, over 800 pages have been converted to a machine-readable format with our evaluation showing character error rates of less than 4%. And these pages are now easily searchable. And machine-readable text in the older writing system can be automatically transliterated to modern writing systems using heuristic rules that already exist. So by enabling access to these texts, our work on improving low resource text recognition is supporting Quacola language research and education. Quacola is an endangered language, and the outputs from our model are being used in language revitalization programs in the community. The texts we extracted are also being used by indigenous language researchers and libraries, including the American Philosophical Society and the Smithsonian. Additionally, the software we developed is open source and researchers around the globe have applied it to many other low resource languages. Here are a few examples that people have told me about. Uh, so in an attempt to collect more data to improve machine translation for P2P literature, researchers have used our models to improve OCR on printed materials in the language. 
Um, a linguist documenting uh, the PRO language used our model to digitize handwritten speech transcriptions. And many languages don't have high coverage digital dictionaries. So our models are being used to extract text from print dictionaries in Igbo. There are lots of exciting research directions stemming from the work I talked about today. And I'll describe a few of the potential extensions here, but I would be very happy to discuss other possibilities after the talk as well. So while the work I presented today is a first step, scaling up to more languages is essential, like being able to digitize documents in the hundreds of languages present in publicly available online archives. Scaling up will need improvements in the text recognition pipeline and interesting and practical directions include using active learning to improve OCR post correction, as well as improving OCR on handwritten documents in low resource languages. Improving text recognition for a large number of languages has potential impact in the scientific domain as well. There is a large amount of older scientific literature that exists only as scanned documents, and the text is often in different languages and different layouts. For example, much, uh, much of the documentary linguistics literature for low resource and endangered languages is not in a machine readable format. So as we saw in the talk today, generic OCR systems are likely not trained on data specific to the target language or the target domain. And while they may be able to provide a good first pass, we can apply OCR post correction to improve the quality of the transcriptions. I would be interested in extending the methods I talked about today to low resource domains as well, beyond just low resource languages. As future work, I'm also interested in extending multilingual models to support under-resourced languages and domains using text extracted from scanned documents. These models can then be used to build NLP systems for various tasks that include many more languages and domains. As I said in the beginning of the talk, some of my previous research focuses on such models to improve named entity recognition and entity linking for low resource languages. In the future, I aim to use multilingual models to build systems for several more tasks like machine translation and summarization that work well for a large number of domains. For example, being able to summarize scientific literature in many languages. However, cross-lingual and tra cross-domain transfer may not be straightforward for low resource settings. And while creating and annotating more data sets is a viable route to improvement, it may also be necessary to develop models that do take advantage of pre-trained language models in combination with data augmentation techniques and other available resources like knowledge graphs and multimodal information, as well as feedback from speakers of the language and users of the systems. So coming back to the main topic of my talk today, we discussed models and applications for OCR post-correction in very low resource settings. Um, I'm leaving the key takeaways from the talk on this site for the discussion period. More about my other research and publications can be found on my website. So thank you so much for your time today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Let's thank our speaker. Great talk, Shruti. I thought this was very cool. Yeah, we have, um, we have about, uh, I guess, 20 minutes or so for uh questions if folks have any i have a few myself but i'll uh let others go first um actually maybe um maybe i'll uh, i'll get started i i have a few so i'm gonna jump at the opportunity okay um i'm curious to hear um a little bit more about uh orthographies that perhaps aren't representable in something like, I don't know, UTF-8. I could be using the wrong terminology here because I'm certainly not an expert in this domain. But it seems like, uh, especially for handwriting, there's probably some characters that simply just don't exist in the alphabets that are representable in, um, I guess, commonly used machine encodings. Um, yeah, I was hoping you could say a few words about um, that. Maybe, maybe this doesn't actually <laughs> exist. Maybe I'm uh, off base here, but I'm curious. Yeah, absolutely. No, um, not at all off base. Uh, there are um, some languages that aren't supported by the, by Unicode. I think Unicode supports something like 154 scripts 
which is, I think, almost a thousand languages, if I'm not wrong. Um, but yeah, as, as you said, there are, you know, languages, maybe specific diacritics and digraphs and so on that aren't supported in Unicode at the moment. Um, that's a really great point. The methods that I presented today are not going to work well for those. Um, and I don't think any OCR systems at the moment consider uh, uh, consider those scripts and and, our, and support those scripts in those languages. Um, I do think, uh, as you said, you know that if we do have to expand to like more than more than a thousand languages, go to two thousand or more languages, we will have to consider those factors as well. That's not something we consider in in the present work. Um, so I, I had a question um, about the post-correction models, and I, and I may have missed a little bit of what you said there. The, um, the post-correction model is not pre-trained at all. It's just trained from scratch yes. on the handled corrections. Okay, mm -hmm. so I guess, have you thought about um, either pre-training or, or like multitask learning for that model, right? So there are some recent results that you can use even very distant supervision for some of these language models like training a model on music can lead it to do better than random on, on like down, downstream language tasks mm -hmm. um, so i wonder even if you know you, you don't have a bunch of um, unlabeled text in the target language mm -hmm. just starting with a model that's been trained on language mm -hmm. um, and maybe the closest language you can find uh, do, do you think that might help yeah, that's a good question. So um, I guess I should maybe first clarify that we are using unlabeled uh, images in the language and like first pass OCR on the unlabeled images in the language, um, which uh, we're using both for pre-training and for semi-supervised learning. So we do have some component of that in there um, in terms of using all the available data in the target language. Um, and additionally, uh, the first pass OCR system we're using is actually um, a system that's trained on like something like 100 languages. So we are able to leverage data in, for example, high resource languages and models that are trained for high resource languages uh, to do transfer to our very low resource setting. In terms of uh, using other uh, sources of information directly for the post-correction task, we have done a few experiments on essentially um, pre-training on higher resource languages, higher resource related languages, for example, using uh, Greek data for Greco and so on. We actually don't have very positive results from that. We've been, uh, we've been getting uh, much better results by just using data from the target language. I think there's a lot to kind of explore here. Um, I think crossing will transfer and maybe transfer from other other types of data uh, would uh, would actually have uh, if we're able to do that I think that would enable much larger scale um, modeling for post correction and enable us to apply this model to lots more languages so that's something I'm very um, excited about and actually something I've started working on a little bit as I said from the from the cross lingual uh, from the cross lingual aspect of it but I don't have positive results from that yet. Awesome. It, thanks. Thanks for that answer. It, it completely answered my question. Um, the oh, one other little question um, in the weighted finite state automata um, mm -hmm. was an, it, it was an interesting architecture that you introduced there. I guess a, a simpler approach for using the lexicon would just be to restrict the um, the, the neural post corrector to only output things that are in the lexicon. Um, that's yes. not going to use the weights, right? And, and it's not going to do any uh, more sophisticated combination between the learned model uh, yes. and, and the weighted finite state automata that might provide a lot of the benefit. I guess, do, do you know if the, the weights and the kind of richer approach that you presented is helpful beyond the simple just, you know, restrict the model to output things that are in vocabulary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, I think there are a couple of reasons we went for this sort of uh, a joint inference approach as opposed to doing, you know, a constrained decoding approach. So um, as I described um, in, uh, so essentially we're building the weighted finite state automaton from automatically created data uh, from the self-training process. So that is inherently going to be quite noisy. And we did want to use the frequency information as a way of somewhat adding a bias towards more correct forms. That was kind of based on our empirical observations on the noise in, in our initial experiments. So that was one of the main reasons we did want to use, uh, we didn't want to do 
constraint decoding in terms of just uh, decoding the words we see in the predictions, because a lot of them are incorrect. And we did want to use uh, the weighted aspect to somewhat try to upweight the correct forms of the words in an automatic way without doing any manual annotation. Um, secondly, while we do have a bunch of unlabeled data, it's still quite a low resource setting. So there are, um, and the way we kind of set up our experiments is we were uh, doing experiments across different documents, um, different uh, layouts, different fonts, and so on. So we didn't want to restrict um, the vocabulary to just what we got from uh, you know, our training set of documents. We did want the model to also be able to generate unknown words. And with the WFSA, that's kind of why we added the unknown word state, so the model would be able to generate those if it wanted to. Um, and uh, so yeah, I think those were like the two main reasons. Um, however, an, another thing that we did think about, and uh, we haven't, uh, we have, I didn't include any results uh, from that in uh, in these publications and in this talk. But a lot of these low resource and endangered languages do have word lists that have been manually created by documentary linguists or people in the community. Um, and that's something we could also use in terms of, as you said, uh, constraint decoding. If we had a high coverage word list or a word list that was almost, uh, we were almost confident that it would cover most of the words in our document. So yeah, it's definitely a possibility if we have higher quality, um, higher coverage word lists. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I see a uh, question on the chat. Oh yeah, it's uh here. I can I can read it. Okay, <laughs> Kyle thank has you. A Sorry. Question. Uh, question for Shruti says Kyle. Uh, could you maybe discuss uh, applicability or extension of your work to handling uh, like math notation? So I guess uh, equations, formulas, and things like that. Yeah, that's a great question. That's actually something I'm uh, I'm really interested in doing. As I said, I think that um, improving um, improving text recognition, especially for things like older scientific documents and so on, uh, would actually be very beneficial to people wanting to wanting to use those documents and be able to use them in their research. So I think that if we were able to, like, while you know the models do work well for low resource languages, I'm sure we could also try to adapt them to uh, domains where we don't have too much training data. For example, if we're trying to do better OCR on equations or better OCR on algorithms and, and so on. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I, I'm really interested in doing that. That's not something um, I've tried immediately, so I don't have, I don't have any results, but I, I think that, I think that we could, we could try to adapt these models with very little training training data um, to try to improve to try to improve those kinds of things as well. I think that one of the other things we have to think of, especially you know, when we're thinking about um, equations in the context of a larger document, uh, we would also maybe have to consider um, uh, the, you know, the topic of the document or text around the equation and so on. That's not something we're considering here. We're basically trying to, um, trying to do post-correction at either the line level or the sentence level, not taking too much document level context into account. Um, and one of the main reasons is we, we don't have too much data to, to be able to train large parameter models. But I'm hoping that you know, for domains where we do have enough data to kind of train larger models, um, maybe in the scientific domain, for example, we could also consider uh, adding more document context to doing post-correction uh, for things like equations and algorithms and so on. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I hope that somewhat answers your question. Um, again, I'm, uh, I don't have any, any experience um, immediately with my models, but I, I hope they can be adapted to, to different domains. Very cool. Um, oh, Shannon, do you have a question? Sorry. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jack. Uh, uh, thank you, Shruti, for the great talk. As someone previously worked a lot on layout and OCR domain, I really love your work, enjoy your talk. And <laughs> perhaps I, I, I guess someone else asked the question before, but I'm really curious about your opinion on this, which is uh, there are definitely different ways to tackle this like OCR issues, right? I mean, OCR tend to do this like from pure visual perspective, and you want mm -hmm. to add like more LP and other uh, training techniques to improve this process. Yes. And I'm also curious about your thoughts on, is there any other better ways that we can try to inject this like a visual information such that yeah. you know, we can get an even better performance from this yeah. model? 
Yeah, that's that's a really great question and something that's uh, it's actually something I've been thinking about a lot. So as I said, you know, the standard setup of OCR post correction, even for uh, higher resource languages like English and so on, um, use doesn't use the visual information and uh, basically tries to improve OCR purely from the language side. And that's kind of what we're doing um, in the work that I presented today. But you are completely right in the sense that we are losing some, or I, I would say we are losing quite a lot of information when we're um, completely discarding uh, the vision side. Uh, I guess what OCR post correction hopes for, and like kind of what we did here too, is that we do have this really big pre-trained um, OCR model that's really good on the vision side. So we're hoping that you know uh, the first pass OCR we. We've transferred enough information um, from, from those large pre-trained models. But I do recognize that um, we may be able to improve even further if we were able to leverage um, the visual information in some sort of uh, iterative OCR sort of way. Um, uh, you know, kind of connecting post-correction with maybe improving our, our OCR on the vision side too. So uh, some of the things I've kind of been trying recently, I don't have concrete results yet, but it does look promising. Um, we do have this unsupervised OCR system called Ocular, which we've been, uh, which we've been experimenting on. And Ocular essentially, um, essentially tries to improve us uh, on, on, on the vision side and also kind of uses a small language model to condition uh, to condition the generative process. So um, some of the things that I've kind of been experimenting with is sort of connecting Ocular to our post-correction system and trying to iteratively feed the outputs between the two tasks to see how it would perform. Um, this is like just a very elementary pipeline in order to kind of connect um, the unsupervised OCR to the post-correction system. Uh, but um, but I'm, I'm hoping that in the future, uh, we could connect them in um, in a better way, maybe even end to end, where we uh, where we use the visual information for iterative OCR as well. Um, I think there are a few things to consider here. So, for example, um, we're using the first pass OCR from these really sort of big pre-trained models, right, like Google Vision or Tesseract. Mm -hmm. And for our low resource languages, we're probably never going to get anywhere close to the number of images they have. And even if even if I sort of even if we kind of train our own model. Um, I don't think we're ever going to have as much data as Google OCR has, for example. So that's why um, I'm basically trying to work on a way where we can kind of leverage information from all, all of these different sources um, in, uh, in a way that doesn't discard any of the sort of uh, resources we have, especially when we're dealing with such a low resource setting. I found that it's important to be able to use all of the available information. Uh, so yeah, that's a great question, um, something I've uh, been thinking about and doing some initial experiments on. Hopefully, um, you know, uh, we'll have some good results with that soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, totally. Uh, especially dealing with this resource in uh, you know, languages, any, you know, re, you know, uh, less reliance on a huge data set is definitely helpful. And, right. and happy to chat with you more on this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Hi, I, I had a related question. So mm -hmm. these uh, pre-trained models, do they ever come with sort of uh, second best predictions, like a top end predictions? And, and could you use that as sort of a a richer signal from them? Oh, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, that's uh, that's not something we've tried. But um, I mean, so for example, when you have these sort of commercial systems, like uh, the Google Vision API, they basically just give you the, the one best prediction. But there are open source systems, as I said, you know, Ocular, and then there's also um, Tesseract, which is open source. And I think um, I think we can probably get more information from from these types of systems in terms of you know confidence and end best predictions. Because um, I mean, most of these systems do use Beam Search, so they will be producing end best predictions anyway. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a really great point. It's not something um, that we've used immediately, but I think especially if we consider sort of doing this iterative OCR approach in some way, um, we can definitely use that information. Um, one of the reasons it might be a little bit difficult is because, uh, well, I guess I guess it won't be I, I guess it won't be difficult, but I guess one of the reasons we didn't try it um, immediately is because uh, the sort of commercially available systems are so good in terms of giving us the first pass OCR, and we just kind of use use the one best. But I think that if we have to rely on improving the vision side of things as well, um, I think using the end best list is a really great way to go. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, I had. One more question. I don't want to. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Time, but um, I was curious to hear uh, perhaps a bit more about 
uh, your interactions with folks who speak Kwakwala? Because I think you mm -hmm. had mentioned that you had actually uh, built some tools that were actually being used by uh, the uh, folks who speak Kwakwala. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm just curious to hear more about that. Yeah, I would be happy to. I would be happy to tell you a little bit more about that. So, um, so yeah, I think throughout this project, one of the things I've really tried to do is uh, kind of make sure that we're digitizing documents that are actually useful for the community, um, and you know that we're building models that that can that are useful and people. Uh, this is an actual problem to solve, right? Um, so uh, this uh, this experience has been really great because I've been directly collaborating with documentary linguists as well as pe people who speak the language. And um, particularly with Kwakala, this has been a really um, fruitful collaboration. Um, we've worked on uh, several different aspects of this together. So. Of course, one of the main uh, one of the main uh, things that we did is, you know, uh, extract the text from these documents that uh, documentary linguists, as well as Kwakula language researchers, have been using for many decades now, and uh, they've basically been just manually searching through uh, scanned images and so on. And digitizing these documents was really high on their priority list, but existing OCR systems uh, weren't able to give them good accuracy. So we basically like gotten outputs on um, hundreds of pages now uh, and extracted the text and sent it over to them. So they're able to use it now. And the other thing we're doing with them that I didn't mention in the talk today is uh, we're conducting basically a user evaluation on how how useful our outputs are compared to existing OCR systems. I do have some initial results on that. Basically, we're trying to um, see how quickly they can correct the outputs from our systems as compared to existing systems or transcribing the text from scratch, which is what they used to do before we before we started this project. So um, it, I mean, essentially, you know, it's at least, you know, comparing to transcribing the text from scratch with our outputs, they're able to cut their time for each page by 15 to 20 minutes, which is a lot like um, they're really happy about that. Um, I don't have full results on that experiment yet, but it was really exciting to see the initial results and they were super happy with our outputs. Um, additionally, I also created a keyboard for this script, which didn't exist before. And um, that was something that I did not expect to do, but we did need it for annotation. So I ended up uh, doing a lot of work on that. And the keyboard is also really useful for them because before they would kind of just copy paste characters, which is really, really slow. Um, but now they have the keyboard, which which is an output from uh, an uh, I guess uh, uh, an output or yeah an output from our work as well and um, the people at the libraries are using that too so yeah a lot of different kind of aspects of, of how this has been useful for them and then with the documentary linguists um, that I'm collaborating with they're really excited specifically about getting all this text extracted because they really want to build tools for the community and they're actually starting on that now so they really want to build automatic speech recognition and predictive keyboards uh, both of which can be done if you have uh, enough text in the language um, so yeah uh, several different directions that my collaborators in the community are taking on based on the text outputs we've given them it's it's been really exciting to work with them Awesome, super impressive. Yeah, that keyboard sounds really cool as well. <laughs> Thankful that you uh, mentioned that, yeah. Um, yeah, do folks have any uh, sort of last questions? I know I wanna be respectful of folks' time. Um, awesome. Uh, well, uh, if there's no more questions right now, uh, maybe we can thank the speaker uh, one more time for her awesome talk. Yeah, thanks, Ruby. Thank you so much for having me. This is really great. And yep, happy to answer questions later if anyone has any. Awesome. Great. Cool. And um, uh, I'm not sure when you're, do you have uh, more interviews, I guess, today? I, uh, no, uh, I, haven't sure. set, I haven't set up anything else today. Oh, right. Okay. Yes. S2 does things. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Cool. Awesome. Great. Well, um, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you, Kyle. Um, okay, thank you so awesome. much. Yeah, great, thanks yeah. so much. It's Ruby. great to see everybody. Bye. Awesome, okay, bye.